I remember reports of something large that was moving unseen. The reports were coming in from the students who frequented the bar for its herbs, fungal samples, and insects. The reports were initially dismissed as nothing more than side effects from the breathing in the miasma. Not soon after, however, new reports of certain wildlife were becoming scarcer in the area. Wildlife that would normally have been in abundance this time of year. This, of course, drew the attention of the university, and a small party comprised of three senior students was formed to investigate the happenstance. A week later, the group returned with no evidence to point to anything amiss, save for the already known absence of the wildlife. Weeks go by, and it drops off as a priority for the university. Then Hamish, a second-year student, went off to the bog in search for toad moss, a particularly effective for treating blister warts. It was when Hamish did not return on the fourth day, a full day after his expected return, that concerns were eventually raised. The head's master then sent Lork, the university's well-known huntsman, who was employed as mainly a pest control when he was not hunting elsewhere. Uh, that it did not take Lork long. In fact, he was back on the eve of the fifth day, alone. The rumors spread quickly, and by that evening, a special assembly was called to quash any doubts, but more importantly, to stop the horrible rumors that seemed to grow in size and complexity as the day went on. Nevertheless, the news was grim. About three days prior, Lork had discovered the tattered remains of a university student's robes. What the headmaster also revealed was five days prior to that, Professor Nelshum, the university's divination instructor, cast the spell Dream Message, but the spell did not trigger. Those familiar with the spell understood that it meant one thing. Amish was likely not among the living. It was then a task team was formed of senior students, instructors, and some outside help. They sent them into the bog to investigate. After several days of no news, the students and instructors still at the university began to settle into the fact that they had to wait. It was then I was awoken one night by the headmaster. He had a sense of urgency about him, and I knew that it took a lot to get him this way. I could not protest, so I followed the headmaster to the lab. My colleague, Joel, botanist for the university, was already there. On one of the examination tables laid a top covering something large. My initial thoughts were of a bear or other large creature, but the outline was disturbingly misshapen. Lorik was also there and he went to the table and pulled back the top, revealing a horrendous sight. Shambler, Joel said under his breath. It was a large monstrosity, vine-like tendrils, some stretching up to ten feet. The core was bulbous and misshapen. It had what appeared to be five, maybe six stubs, like pseudopod appendages, perhaps for locomotion. Its skin, or what could be called skin, was covered in growth that appeared to be in the shape of leaves and thorns. But upon closer inspection, those leaves were leathery in nature and not easily torn. The thorns, however, were very much solid and sharp. It had uh, many superficial cuts and wounds that were now dried over with a brownish crust. Presumably, what was left of the fluids that comprised its internal system. What caught my eye was appeared to be a bone-like structure protruding from the interior body cavity. Joel and I went to work. After some careful dissecting and cataloging, we discovered that something none of us could have thought possible. A shambler, at least this one, was comprised of both mammalian and plant-based. Its internal organs and tissue structure had both, though... The mammalian organs and bones seemed to be spread out and not aligned in the usual fashion. No doubt a result from rapid growth in size. We continued, knowing that the decomposition was setting in, 
but we couldn't lose any valuable opportunity to study this rare specimen. It was Joel that found it at first. Two mammalian eyes, humanoid eyes. At first we thought one was perhaps further along in the decomposition process, but it wasn't. One eye had a brown iris, the second eye a blue. It was again Lork, still in the room, who made the comment. Hamish had two different colored eyes. I too recall this about him. It was a unique birth defect, not something easily confused. Joel and I shared glances. We then found what appeared to be a human right arm. Although it was faint and stretched out, there was the unmistakable outline of a tattoo. By now, the headsmaster was briefed on our findings, and to quell any premature news, we were sworn to keep this a secret. The headsmaster confirmed from two close friends that Hamish had two tattoos on his right arm from before he entered the university. There was no doubt this thing was both Hamish and Plant. Joel and I talked it over when we broke for our food between dissection. We talked about the legends and how they say the first shamblers came into being when spores infected other humanoids. But no one has been able to confirm that. Well, that is until now. Shamblers. Let's start with their appearance. A shambling mound appears to be a mass of twisted vines and other vegetation, standing on two or more legs that resemble tree trunks. When at rest or lying in ambush, they blend in with the vegetation of the swamps or forests where they live. An average shambling mound is roughly 8 feet in diameter, between 6 and 9 feet tall, and weighs approximately 3,800 pounds. Very large. Their origins are mostly of legend. The origin of the Champlain Mound lies in the legendary Green Valley, which might be a remote part of uh, Galarian, or maybe outside of Galarian altogether. Explorers from Aslant, possibly accompanied by elves from Kianun, found the valley and unwittingly became infested with strange spores. When they returned from the valley, the spores turned them into the first Champlain Mounds. The victims then fled into the wilderness, overcome by the horror of their transformation and the knowledge of the valley's location was subsequently lost. The Ecology and Society Shambling mounds are usually solitary creatures. They generally wander in search of prey, and if two just so happen to meet up, they generally ignore each other. Few creatures can sh consider shambling mounds as prey. I mean, they're pretty darn big. They can survive on a diet of rotting vegetation matter and can supplement it with photosynthesis. However, in order to reproduce, they need to absorb living tissue, particularly brain tissue and usually in great quantities, sometimes as much as a ton. However, for some reason, elf tissue is extremely effective. A single elf corpse is sufficient by itself for reproduction of the shambling mound. Some shambling mounds are aware of this and actually seek out elves in preference to other victims. When a shambling mound is ready to reproduce, it finds a suitable hiding place and roots itself into the soil. Approximately a week later, um, a third of its mass detaches itself and makes its own way into the world as a new shambling mound. However, in some rare cases, a shambling mound may develop an empathic ability to draw other shambling mounds to it and enables them to work together as a group. Sometimes these groups seek to establish a connection with the lost green valley. Uh, they might try to go through some meditation or through some activity to destroy like civilization. So this would be like a good pitch for um, maybe a, a mini campaign or even a larger campaign uh, kind of delves in the world of the Cthulhu mythos. Their abilities. Shambling mounds uh, fight by slamming foes and wrapping them up in their vine-like tentacles. Despite their appearance, they do have brains and they're housed in the upper parts of their bodies. They are approximately intelligent as orcs. They can be surprisingly cunning in their pursuit of prey. Uh, they are also reasonably good swimmers. They are strangely resistant to fire. They also take no damage from electrical attacks. Instead, electricity temporarily invigorates them. On occasion, a shambling mound will have a symbiotic relationship with a swarm of insects, often centipedes. Similarly, some become infested with fungi and can discharge clouds of dangerous spores when they are struck. Some variant types of shamblers. 
Um, these are the most common type. Um, I'm sure you can homebrew them your own. The Greensward, a tragic form of Shambler, usually grown from elves. They retain some semblance of their former memories. They are more intelligent than normal Shambling mounds, but they lack the ability to speak. Shambling Monolith, Shamblers that can pull nearby plant matter into the body, temporarily bolstering their power and swelling in size. These are your gargantuan ones. Spore Mound, Shambling mounds infested with fungi and mold in close proximity to where they live. Uh, they appear encrusted in mushrooms and fungal growths. Uh, damaging a spore mound exposes uh, the creature to its symbiotic molds, such as the yellow mold. Stormstruck Shambler, Shambling mounds struck by lightning enough to gain a greater affinity for it. They can expand their uh, vitality to charge their limbs with electricity and shock their foes. Tanglethorn Mound. There is a desert variant that can survive in arid conditions, but is typically unable to swim. These appear as cacti wrapped in thorns and vines. They often burrow beneath the surface in order to ambush prey passing over them. Variant Abilities. Some Shambling Mounds develop unusual and unique abilities, which can overlap with more unusual variants. Common with the green variants, uh, they are particularly attuned to nature and some are able to replicate a number of druidic spells. Compressible form. Some are able to compress their forms, enabling them to squeeze into narrow spaces and making them difficult to damage with bludgeoning or piercing weapons. Symbiotic swarm. Some shamblers that live in close proximity to vermin, such as centipedes, eventually find swarms of the creatures living within their bodies. These swarms typically do not come to the surface of their host enough to be a threat, but they will eagerly seize the chance to consume creatures drawn into the shambler's mass and will burst forth in a swarm upon the host's death. On Galarian, shambling mounds are most common in the Sodden Lands and the Mwangi Expanse. They are drawn there by the exceptional shambling mound called Zandgorhashi. Good luck pronouncing that. There are fungal shambling mounds living in the fungal swamps of Ilverigen, one of the vaults of Orv. Let's talk about the stat block of the Shambler. Found on page 290 in the Pathfinder 2e Bestiary, it is a 6 level creature. It comes with a hefty plus 2 to perception and dark vision. Again, what doesn't have dark vision? It can understand common, elven, sylvan, but not speak any of the languages. Its anatomy simply does not allow for it. It has a plus 16 to athletics, plus 12 to stealth, and a situational plus 18 to stealth if it's in a forest or swamp, for, well, obvious reasons, though it is its uh, normal territory. The Shambler has a plus 6 to strength, plus 1 to dex, plus 5 to con, minus 2 to intelligence, plus 2 to wisdom, and minus 1 to charisma. The Shambler has a unique ability called Mound. When it is not in danger, i.e. combat, the Shambler spends one minute settling into a pile that looks like a lump of loose vegetation. While it is in this form, creatures must actively seek to succeed on a DC 22 perception check, but a DC 28 in forests and swamps, to then detect the Shambler's true nature. The adventurers, unless they really know what they're looking for, are not going to find this thing before it finds them. This is very helpful for DMs to realize this. The Shambler has an AC of 22, a fortitude save of plus 17, a reflex save of plus 11, and a will save of plus 14. It has 120 hit points, so it's going to take a bare fit of punishment before it goes down. The Shambler has a very unique immunity to electricity and has fire resistance 5. One would think, being made up of plants, that it wouldn't have fire resistance at all, but it does. Playing on that electricity immunity, the Shambler has a unique ability called Electric Surge. Whenever the Shambler would take electricity damage or has been targeted with an electricity effect, it gains 12 temporary hit points and is quickened until the end of its next turn. It can use its extra action to either stride, strike, or swim. For players not familiar with the Shambler, this can become a big surprise if they ever use an electric-based attack. The other ability the Shambler has is called a Shamble. Shockingly choice of name, am I right? To use this ability, the first requirement is the Shambler must be in its mound form. The trigger then becomes when a creature who is unaware of the Shambler's true nature and comes within 10 feet, the following effect can be used. The Shambler makes a vine strike against that creature. 
then you roll initiative. It is uh, This is obviously used for an ambush situation, and it's a very good tool for DMs to really start off a good combat encounter, kind of get a little crunch going in the beginning. One of the Shambler's obvious weaknesses is going to be its speed. With only 20 feet of movement and 20 feet of swim movement, players who are not hindered by difficult terrain are going to be able to keep their distance from it. I would like to point out the Shambler's home environment is forest and swamps, and many times that type of terrain is going to have perhaps difficult terrain within it. I really feel the Shambler should get some type of bonus or to forego the penalties of its uh, preferred terrain type. But, you know, the players are going to need some kind of chance, right? The Shambler has two main attacks. The first is the melee vine attack, requiring one action, which has a plus 17 to hit, and a reach of 10, no surprise. Damage is a 2d8 plus 8 bludgeoning plus grab. For DMs, if the vine attack hits, that creature is grabbed, causing the flat foot in an immobilized condition, making it that much easier to do a follow-up attack. Players are not going to want to beat in this position for long. Also, given that the Shamblers have multiple vine appendages, I would definitely let the Shambler be able to vine attack and then grab three or four players if it could on that turn. Vine Leash, requiring two actions, allows for a quasi area of attack that lets you, the Shambler, make vine strikes against each creature within reach. Having 10 feet, that's a lot of reach and potentially a lot of creatures then its multiple attack penalty increases only after the attacks happen. So this is a really good thing to use right off the bat. Imagine that the Shambler surprises a group of ventures, perhaps maybe three or four, and they're all within its reach. Sets this vine leash out and, and bank all of them with a hit, all of them will then suffer the grab condition. This is certainly uh, can be a tough fight for a party whose players are not familiar with the Shambler. Deems you should really play up all of the Shambler has to offer and not just run it as a uh, hit point sponge. This thing can really be deadly given the right conditions. Now, as all good DMs are, we should really reward the players after a good fight. It's common for Shamblers to collect trinkets from their previous victims, store them in the small hollows within their bodies. They particularly prize gems, but they also store alchemical or magical items that produce electrical effects, such as bottled lightning or shock runes. Well, this is all I have for now on The Shambler. Thank you for joining me. Um, if you like it, like and subscribe. It certainly will help me out. And look forward to doing the next video. Thank you.